Traveling the Vortex. We've joined Susan as she travels the Vortex and arrive at episode 528. I hope you brought, brought biscuits to the negotiations and to this podcast. I'm Keith. I'm Sean. I'm Glenn. Biscuits, anyone? <laughs> I like biscuits. You're going to hand them around? Yeah. You know, it's funny. It was just Biscuit Week on Bake Off. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, second episode. What a coinkie Dropped on Tuesday slash Friday. I like them with gravy. <laughs> what? You're sick. <laughs> biscuits and gravy. the kind of biscuits we're talking about, Sean. We're talking about cookies. What? British why biscuits. You, why didn't you say cookies, then? Because it's a UK thing. These are these are not like light and fluffy, buttery, flaky layered biscuits. No. Some, but they're not going to be the biscuits you're thinking of. Oh, now I'm disappointed. Uh, we got to stop talking about this because I'm fasting and I can't <laughs> eat anything. Oh. <laughs> That's making me hungry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we've been away for a while. Did you guys do anything uh, fun in the uh, last few weeks? See any movies or anything? It's, it's too much. I have to sum up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, maybe I should um, go. I'll go first because go first. I, I don't typically watch a lot of stuff. But um, I did watch uh, the um, the day the music died, which is the uh, Don McLean um, documentary about the song "The Day the Music Died," and uh, it incorporates you know, the uh, Buddy Holly, you know, the the crash basically that killed the Big Bopper, Buddy Holly, and. Uh, Richie Valens. Uh, it's really good. It's it's quite interesting. Um, I think it's the most definitive answer behind the mystery of what the the lyrics of the song are. Uh, he kind of steps through and and basically obliviates a lot of the mythos that <laughs> was around it. You know, surrounds the the actual meaning of the song. But there are some pieces there that that he intended. So. I really enjoyed that. And then we saw um, on National Cinema Day, we went and saw uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, the, the re-release with the uh, added content. Is the added content worth it? So we paid $3 because it was Cinema Day. <laughs> um, and I was very, uh, that was totally worth it for $3. I think the stuff that's added in was interesting, but I don't think that full cost of a ticket is worth it, especially after it's been out for so long and it's already on Blu-ray and, and I can watch it as many times as I want. It was nice seeing it again on the big screen. And like I say, I don't regret doing it for National Cinema Day, but I don't I don't know that I would have been all that happy with paying full price again, again for it. But Keith, what did you do? I actually got to watch some stuff. I uh, We watched Elvis, mm. which was okay. Just okay? I, I, I wasn't overly impressed by it. It kind of, it felt like it glossed over a lot of the interesting parts and focused on parts I didn't really care that much about. Now, granted, I didn't know all about the Colonel Parker stuff in his life, so that that was interesting to to learn about. But I could always tell that it was Tom Hanks. And while Tom Hanks did a good job, I I like I prefer my Tom Hanks to be likable, <laughs> and he was not likable. So I understood why. He did that role, but I wish they would have maybe found somebody else that wasn't so plain, plainly obvious that it was Tom Hanks. Mm. And then I was able to watch all of Light and Magic, which was phenomenal. That was such a good series. So good. Other than that, I've been able to stay up on House of the Dragon and She-Hulk. All right. Well, should we? Uh... Oh, Sean, what have you done? I mean, you were going to do a quick wrap of everything that you've seen. A oh, quick wrap. Um, well, I got COVID. Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> I, I lost my uh, my pandemic gold star. I brought it home from school with her. We watched a um, couple of things. I, I checked out the documentary JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass, mm-hmm. which is uh, the, uh, if you remember the end of the movie JFK, where they talk about all the, the, the classified documents that will be declassified in the year, blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> they've been declassified. Not all of them, and, but well, a good chunk of them have now yeah. been. Uh, at least a good chunk of them have now been had a good chunk of them declassified. Right, <laughs> right. 
And so Oliver Stone has put this together. Now, admittedly, knowing that it's Oliver Stone, he's, of course, going to present the evidence from these documents in such a fashion to fit the narrative that he's already spun. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm not uh, naive enough to, I, I've learned my lesson ever since Werner Herzog presented a documentary about French cave paintings and uh, uh, then included radioactive albino alligators at the end of it for no reason. I, I've <laughs> lost all faith in documentaries that they're, that they're supposed to represent the truth. But anyway, um, I, I understand that there's probably still a slant, if you will, to this. But let me tell you, whether you believe in a, a, a conspiracy or not, whether you believe the the Warren report or not, whether you, you – all of that aside, it is very, very obvious reading through these documents and looking at the evidence that is presented. If the U.S. government was not responsible for the assassination of JFK, they sure as hell were involved in one hell of a cover-up of something. Because it is irrefutable <laughs> the amount of things that got screwed up. And it's just mind-boggling how badly they, they, they dropped the ball on it. Mm. There's no other excuse for it. So it's, it was, that, was, that was a big eye-opener. Even for somebody right. who does believe in, in the conspiracy that, that something else was afoot. And then uh, most recently, Mel and I went out this, this past week and saw uh, See How They Run at the theater. Uh, which is the new Cersei Ronan and uh, Sam Rockwell oh, right, it. Right. And it is uh, delightful. Mm. It's a very cute, very uh, enjoyable Agatha Christie style mystery uh, that uh, kind of pokes fun at the whodunit Agatha Christie style mystery uh, while still remaining true to all of the tropes. And it's not as good as Knives Out. But it's just refreshing to have yet another. I, I, I like whodunits and I like big casts and I like, you know, I like those type of movies and uh, you know, the frantic pacing and things of that nature. So it was kind of uh, nice to have another one in that pantheon come down the pipeline. Hmm. They all say who. Do you collect Doctor Who? Do you have Doctor Who items and you don't know you collect Doctor Who? For all things in the Doctor Who collecting world, tune in to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, a Direction Point Network podcast. I am Larry Van Rusbergen, your host, and I have been collecting Doctor Who for 40 years. With popular features like collection protection and the most outrageous offer, we have a lot of fun. Available anywhere you get your podcasts. You're listening to Traveling the Vortex, a Direction Point Network podcast. All right, well, let's move on to our reviews. We are still reviewing the Time War. We've actually moved over into uh, Act 2. This uh, set of uh, stories coming up will start the second act of the Time War. And, yes, we're doing Short Trips, All Hands on Deck, which was in the Short Trips uh, Series 7. And then we're going to do Time War, uh, Susan's War. Doctor Who, Short Trips. After everything, I ended up back at Coal Hill School. It hadn't been a school for a long time. They converted it into flats over a hundred years ago. The building had more or less survived the first Dalek invasion, but there was so much work to do to get it habitable again, nobody got round to it before the second invasion hit. It had just been reopened when I was looking for a new place, somewhere smaller. I didn't need the space anymore. I could hardly say no when I realised it was available. It had always been a lovely old building, and now the playground had been torn up and a garden planted there. And in the quad, in the middle of the school, years and years ago, someone had planted an oak tree in memory of Ian and Barbara. It didn't say when they died. The plaque had obviously been replaced more than once, but the tree was a huge, gnarled and knotted thing. They'd had to cut it back when they renovated the place, as it had grown through several of the windows and caused a lot of damage. But I'm glad they didn't cut it down. Only a couple of the other flats were occupied, so it was quiet, but I didn't mind that. My flat was on the ground floor. Small, three rooms. I didn't have a lot of things. And the main room had previously been a classroom, where almost 250 years ago I'd been taught English. 
I remember quite clearly one afternoon when I sat by the window, which was now in my kitchen, reading the part of Cordelia from King Lear along with the class and confidently told the teacher, Miss Ireland, that this was nothing like what had really happened and being told I was missing the point and I was standing by that same window at 3.38 in the morning in late October making myself some tea when the emergency call came in. We'd used a lot of salvaged Dalek technology in the process of getting ourselves back on our feet, mostly making use of their power generators and chemical synthesizers, and I'd been helping to make it compatible with what they had on Earth. Even then, the technology was security-equipped to resist being used by anyone who wasn't a Dalek. And although I'd hoped to move on to other projects by now, instead I was still spending a lot of my time tinkering with the equipment hoping I could get it to work better. The synthesizer I'd been working on earlier that day was set up in a warehouse in King's Cross, suspended in a web of virtual cable routers which could simulate the necessary Dalek commands. The upshot of the rather panicked call I received was that the synthesizer was doing things nobody had ever seen it do before. Its data output had gone haywire and it was draining energy from the local systems in huge waves. Big finish. We love stories. Everyone Susan Campbell cared about has gone. Most of them died on in the second Dalek invasion, and her grandfather never visits. She's living in what used to be Coal Hill School, helping Earth rebuild again. Then one night, she's called away to help with an emergency. A piece of appropriated Dalek technology is malfunctioning, and everyone's afraid of what it might do. This is just the first in a sequence of predicaments facing Susan, and the connection between them will shape the rest of her life. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Yeah. A good prologue to what we're going to review next. Yeah, I, th- I think <laughs> so. I, I think it uh, is a nice little way to sort of maneuver her into the... Uh, yeah, the box set that we're going to be reviewing here coming up, and and uh, I I really quite enjoyed it. Um, it took me a little while to get used to again the um, first person perspective of kind of doing everything and telling uh, telling the, the the story themselves. But it's kind of nice that you know, I mean, I it, it still has that kind of first person narrative we do have, but uh, yeah, it's very Susan focused until the doctor shows up. And even after the doctor shows up, it still stays very Susan focused. So, and I found the story enjoyable too, because it's, you know, Susan still living her life on earth. And I, I never really thought about, okay, well post what we listened to uh, an earthly child and okay. The second Dalek invasion. Okay. What would happen to her life after that and how long she would live, which is, Kind of a, a nice that they explore that, and then time more aspect of these call up papers coming for her, and then the sweet idea of the doctor trying to circumvent them and keep her from actually re- opening the cube, the right. message cube, right? To get to find out what's actually going on out in the universe, I thought was a really nice, clever idea. Yeah, I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed most aspects of this story. Uh, first of all, I love Susan and I love the fact that we get old Susan because it's, it's such a refreshing change to hear Susan Foreman as an adult, as opposed to Susan Foreman, the kind of, uh, squeaky wheeled teenager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. If you know what I mean. And, um, there's just not enough stories. And I, I've even gotten a couple of them in the, the eighth doctor adventures that we have not gotten to yet. Um, but, um, spoilers. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's always, it's always nice to, to have Caroline Ford back for that, which is great. And the fact that she's doing all of the narration for it. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that Cole Hill school is now an apartment complex. That seems like a very, you know, urban gentrification kind of thing that would happen and the symmetry of it that she's back at Cole Hill and laughing about it and you know okay totally on board with that that's great I love the fact that they are reverse engineering all this leftover Dalek technology trying to 
make use of it, make sense of it, and you know, rebuild the world with it. Um, all of that is, is is great. Oddly, where the story falls down a little bit for me is when the Eighth Doctor arrives. I have not been a fan of the relationship aspect of the Eighth Doctor and Susan. And there's a reason for it, which I can't get into because we haven't listened to that audio. And there's a very strong reason for it. Um, and it's, it's, I'm certainly, you know, it is justified. Susan is still harboring a great deal of, I mean, it's toned down, but I mean, there, there is some anger, there's some resentment, there is some, you left me, you know, um, kind of issues still to deal with despite the fact that she had a life and that she had David and, and, and then later their, uh, her son um, and, and all of the things that happened, it was still being abandoned by grandpa. And I think it's a little unfair that the eighth doctor is the one that winds up kind of taking the brunt of that. I was so looking forward to their reuniting just Susan and the doctor getting back together and, Oh, it's the eighth doctor who I love. Cause he's kind of this, this, t this, this teddy bear and everybody likes the eighth doctor except Susan. And so every time they're together, despite the fact that they love each other very much, they are at odds with each other very much. And even though it's not Paul McGann, it's this, um, because they, they, they have these great moments together when they are in audios together, but it's still this, this same kind of strained, relationship status and carol does a great job carrying that through in the audio but it immediately kind of it's 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 a personal thing i understand it's all on me but it just is like ah, oh, i hate the fact that we're fighting it just bothers me and then the fact that the doctor's plan quite honestly i get his reasoning behind it but it seems childish it seems very childish it's a very immature way of doing it that he's going to risk putting other people in danger just so that susan doesn't get this this message what what uh, what story haven't we listened to that you were privy to uh in the um an earthly child it's or have we listened the, to that it's it's to the death there's another one where she shows yes. up in the eighth doctor line after okay. an earthly child. I was going to say because yes. we listened, it's we listened. The, it's in the fourth season. Okay, we listened to an earthly child, so yeah, that's we why to okay. an earthly I was child. confused yeah. by that because I thought, wait a minute, I thought we'd heard that already. So okay, yeah, okay, okay. yes, yes. So Thank there's you, a, there's another one. There is another one. I oh, got you. Yeah. Okay. As I was saying it, I was thinking to myself, I thought we had reviewed this, but I, it's, it's the events of the second one is specifically where. Um things turn a little bit but, I, got I mean not that they were all that friendly in the first one but yeah yeah you know where I i'm coming that. from but I yeah can i see just what you're saying but i think it's i like the fact that it's true to the character that they're they are at odds and while my fandom heart is like well i want them to be you know chummy and how they used to be my my logical brain and my story my brain that lets me you know critically look at s stories goes oh that makes sense and it's fascinating that yeah. they're at odds and it's interesting to listen to them work through these issues. And it, it, it does make a, a large amount of writing sense that of all of the doctors to pair her up with and give her this conflict, it's the eighth doctor because it seems like he would be the one least likely to have conflict with Susan. Yeah. Besides... I, I could see the seventh doctor being very at odds because of how his personality is that she would not approve of some of the things that he, especially the, the, the later season kind of darker per personality. Yeah. Uh, McCoy doctor. Uh, but like I said, Paul McGann's doctor is almost always so lovely and, and warm and inviting and Victorian and, you know, or Edwardian and just, he, he's, he's, he's just, a, just, a, he's just, he's just cuddly. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's like, yay, Susan and, 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 and McGann. Yay. No, you don't get it. And I, I get the reason why. I totally get it, but it just sets my teeth on edge. <laughs> well, and, and I, I know what you're saying, but I, of course, we're, we'll get to it when we review that later where we actually get Paul McGann show up. I think it's a little, I think the relationship is a little better there, too. I mm -hmm. think what I liked about this is just him going to the great efforts to try to keep her out of the war. He's very much 
doing this probably the wrong way, but he's yeah. very much got her best interest uh, at heart. And so doing the wrong thing for the right. reason, Right. Exactly. So I kind of, that's what I sort of enjoyed about this. Um, I think that he went about it kind of a weird way, but <laughs> um, no, I, I, I really kind of, I was a, a bit, it was a bit endearing that he was kind of doing everything he could to keep her from assembling that cube and, and, you know, being called home. So, and I also like the idea that she got to kind of turn the tables on him at the end and yeah. do what he did to her. Right. Yeah. Even using yeah. some of the same dialogue. I right. mean, that was a nice touch and a nice turn to lock him out and take off and leave him behind, even yeah. though he's not really left behind. But you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. No, it was it was a neat way of turning the tables. Yeah, the the, the, the symmetry there was was, was quite quite lovely. It's a strong story all the way around. Yeah, I would agree. Mm-hmm. You were invited on an adventure across all of time and space, in a completely random order. It's the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. Jump in the TARDIS with your hosts, Eric Goldbranson, Asad Cheshki, and Matthew Kressel. Explore Doctor Who TV stories, audio adventures, and books, both novels and non-fiction. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. It's the entire Hooniverse. On Shuffle. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast is a member of the Direction Point Network and is available about once a month wherever you find your podcasts. You are listening to Traveling the Vortex. All right, well, let's move on to our next one. From Big Finish Productions, Susan's War. Ian! Susan! (laughs) Welcome to Gallifrey, Ian Chesterton. Welcome back to the Sense Sphere, Susan and Ian. I am Second Elder. The Daleks greet you! Quaid require materials for repairs. May I request that you speak less loudly? We will comply. What is it? There's something on the screen. A lot of somethings. In attack formation. The invasion. Charge! They're charging at the attack ship! Maybe it's best to get it over quickly. One more. Fire! Ogrons! In headsets! Robotized Ogrons! They're Robogrons. What exactly is this weapon we're here to see? This. Come on! The alarm! The Orovics, they're loose. They've got out. They're loose in the command compound. You can't prevent the war. Why not? You helped bring it about. I did not. But in the Earth year 1963. How about you get out of my way? Oh! A time ring? Grandfather? Well, he's grandfather now. I always was. Will you stop dithering and send the message, child? Oh, goodness. Outside, we've got renegade Dalek rockers. Inside, Dalek mods from the time war. Big finish. We love stories. No! Exterminate! Sphere of Influence. Gallifrey needs every Time Lord to fight the Time War. A summons has been issued across the universe to its prodigals. Whatever the skills, the war effort can use them. Susan's call-up papers have arrived, and unlike her grandfather, she's willing to join her people's battle and finally return home. Because Susan knows the Daleks, and she will do her duty. Susan's first mission is one of diplomacy. The Sense Sphere could prove a valuable ally to Gallifrey, but she is not the only one who knows the Sensorites of old. Susan will have the support of an old friend. Ian Chesterton is about to rejoin the adventure he left a lifetime ago. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, I I completely adored this, bump, this uh, box set. It's uh, very, very good. It hits all the nostalgia buttons that you want it to hit, and mm. then also kind of advances, you know, the sin sphere and the sensor rights a little bit more than the original story did. I thought it did a very, very good job of uh, kind of harkening back to the sense sphere and making use of the groundwork that had been laid mm-hmm. in that story, in that in that uh, that serial, and kind of giving us a reason to return to them that was logical and made sense within the confines of the uh, the time war and why the Daleks would be interested and every, everything fit together so neatly. There was a lot of very nifty world building that happened um, with that. 
And anytime you can give me that, on, I mean, on top of the, oh, nostalgia button pushing, I like that. But anytime it makes sense for you to be pushing that nostalgia button, mm. I'm all on board with that. Oh, and you brought Ian back too? Okay. <laughs> I'm sitting <laughs> on my cake. There wasn't much for him to do, but that didn't matter. It's icing on the cake. Well, well no. He, he got to play the old version of him, which was also a nice. It wasn't him trying to be young. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Although I, I felt that you could, there were, there just, there seemed to be a hole there though, without Barbara coming. And I think what makes it even more obvious is the fact that he's talking to her on the phone, presumably before he's picked up. And then when they go back to drop him off, he asks Susan if she wants to stick around to see her and and she doesn't because she's got to run off. And so it felt like they were too making it too obvious that she's still around. But then that was a bit of a letdown because I felt like I really think that she should have been part of the adventure. And I know she can't because the actress has died, but that just felt like a, a, Barbara sized hole in the story. It didn't, it didn't take away from how good the story was. Um, and it didn't take away from the fact that I was very excited to see Ian and Susan back together, but having Barbara not there was, was very glaringly obvious. Well, didn't Barbara not really have a big role in the sense of rights anyways? I mean, I remember it being a very Susan heavy story, but I remember. Well, that's, that's Ian tr- having a bit more of a role than Barbara anyway. So in addition to the idea of, you know, them deftly maneuvering around the fact that the actress had passed away, I, it, having it be the censorites, I think makes sense too. Yeah, no, that, that, that is true. Um, but wasn't that because, um, oh, what's the actress's name? Um, oh, it's escaping me. Anyway, the actress, she had, she was on holiday. Wasn't she for a few of the stories? Oh, was that, was that? Yeah, one, I one? believe that's why. Yeah. <laughs> If I'm remembering right, I think I, I, I get where both of you are coming from. I, I appreciated the fact that they worked her into the story, so that we we kind of have canonized now. Ian and Barbara were a thing. Mm-hmm. That that that's okay. Not not that we all didn't know that, but now it's official. Uh, but it's also a, a, a nice way to include her, even though we couldn't have her in the story because of the actress passing but i agree with glenn that there surely was a little better way to do it than oh you just missed her you know she was on the why why couldn't susan have just hey i've got to get back um you know it was lovely to see you and leave and then barbara happens to walk in the door oh you won't believe what just happened you know let it let it be kind of on barbara that she just missed her as opposed to susan not wanting to hang around to catch her because then it does feel like i mean i can't imagine not wanting to say hi yeah, you have a time machine. <laughs> you, 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 you could wait a few minutes. You could have. And, you know, I also would have been okay with her staying, saying, "Okay, yeah, I'll stay," and then the episode ending. Yeah, you know, the fact that, that Susan too. gets to see her, but we don't get to see that interaction. I, I, I understand why they would do that. So, I'd be okay with it. I'd be disappointed, but I'd be okay with it. Jacqueline Hill. That's who it was. Yeah, yeah. Jacqueline. Um, thank you. I couldn't think of her name either. So you don't, you don't consider the, uh, wedding from hunters of the burning, uh, stone from the 11th doctor story. You didn't consider that canon. That didn't canonize the fact that, um, Ian and Barbara had gotten together since they get married in that particular comic that we've reviewed. It's bold of you to assume that I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look that up too. I don't remember that one. <laughs> Thank you for backing me up on that, Keith. <laughs> uh, we reviewed this one? Yeah, we reviewed, we reviewed it. <laughs> did we? Yeah, it's we a Doctor did. Who magazine comic. Yeah, it is. I, I think it was in um, something we were doing when we were doing uh, Fourth Doctor stuff. Or not Fourth Doctor, Eleventh Doctor stuff, but I, I can't remember what it was. Well, to, to be fair, um, yes, I consider all of it canon, but... <laughs> officially and and i know doctor who canon is like yeah right i mean this is doctor who magazine but officially canon is televised episodes but since the televised episodes have canonized big finish 
and this is now Big Finish, this is now canon. So that's how I'm rationalizing that. Well, but the televised tape, episodes have not tele, have not canonized comic. Appearances. You're wrong. You are absolutely wrong. And the reason why you're wrong is because we saw Absalon Dak in that one episode of it's the true. Time Heist. Uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and there's been so, of you to assume I remember things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, no, I know what you meant though. <laughs> I'm really kind of picking on you. Keith, Keith, you're going to have to, uh, to to send me the details of this comic later because I don't remember. Yeah, I'll, which I'll one send this you is. the wiki list. Okay, wiki, wiki entry. <laughs> in I the uh, remember it in, I probably well. have the comic on the shelf. The, I just don't remember it. This doesn't help, but uh, in the book, Day of the Doctor, it is mentioned that Ian and Barbara are on their fourth honeymoon. So, oh, nice. Well, okay, that's canon then. Well, it's the book, though. It's, the, it's, it's the novelization of the TVs. So it didn't It didn't air. It just was added to the book. So, kind of Although, that, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong, that one was written by uh, uh, Stephen Moffat. And so, to me, that's, yeah, pretty, that's, that's pretty canon. So. I have no memory of this. <laughs> well, I don't think we've read the... We haven't read the novelization. No, he's document. talking about the comic. Oh, the comic. <laughs> Yeah, I have no memory of this. Well, at maybe all. we didn't review it. Maybe I just read it myself. I think you read it yourself. But I thought I, don't remember it I thought I put either. it I thought I put it together with something that we were doing that was an eleventh doctor story. Why do I why do I remember it being connected to that? Glenn has whole schedules of things that Because the eleventh eleventh yeah. doctor's in it. According to this, it was celebrated the fiftieth anniversary. Yeah, I remember, I, remember I, I think we pretty much I think we did it. I'll have to go back and look at the don't we have thorough documents? On yeah, this we now? do have. We'll have to go back and look through the documentation. <laughs> Somebody check the historical records. Maybe, maybe it was one that we had originally added in a grouping of stuff, and then we ended up pulling it because it was one one thing too many. I don't know, but I remember putting it together for something we were going to review for sure, and I and I read it so. Maybe we couldn't get a copy of it because it was Doctor Who magazine. It wasn't available on this side of the pond or something. He just said he read it. <laughs> Well, that doesn't mean he read it at the time we were going to review it. I did because oh, I, I did because it was right around the fiftieth. So, but I've been getting Doctor Who magazine for seven years now, eight years now. Digital, maybe. Anyway. Maybe Glenn read it and <laughs> held on to this piece of knowledge, knowing that eight years down the road he was going to come <laughs> back and, and circle back to it and go, "I'm going to tell them they reviewed this, even though they didn't." <laughs> it's not been. A, it's a long game plot. <laughs> He's totally doing the, uh, the, 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 the Edgar Allan Poe thing where he's driving us insane. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, uh, let's, get, no let's, get, back, let's get back to our reviews. <laughs> I thought the, the overall plot and how, you know, the Dalek infiltration into the sin sphere, I thought that was a really pretty well clever way to tie, try to bring the sense rights into the time more besides... Susan coming to try to get help. Well, it just is the idea that, uh, you know, the sense rights, oh, we're, we're, we're sensitive to uh, loud noises. Oh, the Daleks are coming to visit. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a certain amount of arrogance, too, when they, when the Daleks come the first time and they make the Daleks believe that, oh, how did they, somehow they convince them to not attack or not to come. And so there was a bit of an arrogance that they were safe from this war and they were safe from the Daleks because they were able to do that. So to have the one that infiltrates into the sense sphere, I thought that was, that was kind of cool. So are, did anybody else get the idea that this was the, uh, the, the eye stock in the head variety of uh infiltration unit or. It's how I imagined it, but they yeah. never really said anything about the eye stock. So I just assume maybe we didn't see, or they the ice stock never came out like it did yeah. in the in the uh, TV episodes. But I assumed it was kind of the same thing because it's I did, they're yeah. obviously beyond the Robo Man uh, technology. They make they make reference to the fact that it's more advanced now, so they don't have they don't use the headsets. Well, let's move on to the next one. The uncertain shore. Susan and Commander Velkin are on the trail of a spy. 
Undercover on a ravaged world, they find a weary population trapped and waiting for the inevitable. But one among them is a traitor. The time war is coming to Florana, and Susan will face a struggle to simply survive. Oh, no bum 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 from you, Sean. Well, I, I have a complicated feeling with this one. <laughs> well, go ahead and start. <laughs> so, I loved the um, Casablanca feel to it. That, that we, we've got this uh, the, the, this kind of resort out of time. Uh, there's a bar. There's all these uh, people that are just kind of there waiting for the inevitable. And some of them want to get out. Some of them can't get out. And some of them are there for the resistance. I mean, it, it had a very Casablanca feel to it. And I loved that. I loved meeting our, our little troop of characters and suspects and who was involved and who wasn't. And all, all of that was fascinating to me. I don't feel like the spy element to the story worked at all. It wasn't there, clear that that's what they were doing in the first place. Either. Yeah. And, and even when we get down to the resolution of it, it, it was just, eh, there, there was no, I don't feel like there was any strong reason for Susan and, uh, 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 what's her name? Um, Velklin. 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 To have been sent Veclin. on this mission. Veclin. Veclin. Veclin thank you. Um, there, there was no reason for them really to have been sent on this mission because ultimately their involvement or non involvement was immaterial. It, it, it wouldn't have mattered to the outcome. Yeah, I so suppose it, it just it kind of felt hollow. It was like, why are we mucking about dealing with? I mean, because you're 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 there. Oh, there's a spy, but the spy didn't do anything. And yeah. I mean, there, there was just there was no payoff. There were no stakes. There was nothing. I mean, it was this it was this tiny little backwater that was going to get overrun, and then did. And it was like, okay, <laughs> why are you wasting an agent on this? <laughs> Surely there are bigger fish to fry. That was that was my only complaint about it. I yeah. loved the elements of the story just didn't like the story no i i i think you're absolutely right and it almost it almost gives it a feel of this is a filler story in order to bolster this box set but i i also agree that i think that the story is is interesting i like the casablanca aspect as you said i like the um visiting the idea of a resort that is on the precipice of invasion and knowing that these are sort of the last days or even last hours before uh, the invasion begins. And so I, I really liked the way that they were um, framing that. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, the Ogrons showing up. Yeah, um, that was cool. And the Ogrons. <laughs> <laughs> Robo Grons. And the fact that um all you had to do is play dead and they just left you alone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's dead. Move along. <laughs> um and I, I what a neat idea that the Robo Grons become smarter. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> Only marginally though. Marginally, right. <laughs> I, I like the things that you mentioned too, Glenn. And uh, I did struggle a lot to find the plot with the spy. You know, they talk about the spy a lot, but they never really explain why the spy is so important. And then when it, then it comes out, you know, it's just she was a Dalek spy that was trying to infiltrate the ADF, and it's like well, that's all that really was, and it didn't seem that it was that important of a story. But I had enough fun listening to it that I. I was able to excuse it because Susan and Velkin, Veklin's relationship was great. It was, it's good to, I like having those two paired up through this entire box set. In fact, the one where Veklin's barely, barely there, I was kind of disappointed she wasn't there more for. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it, the, the relationships and, you know, kind of how they structured this story kind of carried it through it when the plot was kind of lacking. Yeah, it's very much an exercise in style over substance, and I was totally okay with the style. All right, let's move on to Assets of War. Cardinal Rasmus believes that Susan's special abilities will help him assess a new weapons project. On a secret military base, creatures from the Vortex are being bred for war. Gallifrey's scientists think they can be used as assets against the Daleks, but the Orovics are not easily tamed. 
Bum, bum, bum. Eh, I didn't like this one that much. It didn't seem this like this was it, probably my least favorite in the box. Yeah, it didn't seem like it was a necess- It was it wasn't necessary because it's uh, ends up being kind of a whiny, vindictive um, guy who is utilizing these things that they we know from the beginning that the Time Lords aren't going to have any control with. So you know where it's going to kind of go. Um, what it does do, though, is it gives chan- uh, Susan a chance to use her powers that were set up way back in the Sensorites. Uh, again, you know, used uh, before in, in the uh, first story in this one as well. But being able to actually uh, use that kind of empathic uh, sense that she has. So, so that was kind of cool and useful. But overall, I was just kind of meh. It was, you know, and the scientist guy that was in head of all this thing him just you know well let let it run its course this will be the uh field test that we need just i mean there should have been also more consequence for him at the end and there's not so yeah overall go go ahead ahead. i was gonna say it almost ends ends in a way of well not only was there no consequences but it comes across like well we still might be able to use these things yeah exactly exactly Mm, no (laughs) right so no i just i think those were those were the issues that i had with it i mean it again it it it's susan and vecklin and i thought they they did you know a pretty decent job but again vecklin's not used as much as i think she could be in this one all valid points all 100 percent completely accurate it's aliens in doctor who yeah yeah yeah, I was okay with that because it's aliens, and I love aliens. Uh, there are no surprises here. It's like, oh, these things are vicious. They're going to get out. Why can the Time Lords not say? Oh, well, of course, they can't see it because they're Time Lords. They're too busy being... <laughs> they're too busy being Time Lords. <laughs> this is their MO. This is what they do. Well, this couldn't possibly hurt us. We have complete... Con- oh, what, what do you mean? It's out already. Yeah. Oh, no. Right. We brought Susan in specifically to do this thing. Now we're not going to listen to her. And it, it's it's just... It's chapter and verse stupid bureaucracy. And, and so it, it's one of those... This is going to be a very frustrating story because you're going to do the thing. And we're going to tell you not to do the thing. And you're going to do the thing anyway. And then the thing that we told you was going to happen is going to happen. And then we're all going to have to survive it. And then ultimately at the end, you're not going to learn the lesson. Right. And every now and then I like that story. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's simple. And I think coming off of the spy one where I was really wrapping my brain around trying to figure out why the spy was so important. (laughs) And coming up with nothing, as soon as this one started, and they laid out the path, and they lit the <laughs> runway for me, I was like, okay, <laughs> I'm with you. Let's go. Because um, there, there are. There are no surprises here. It's, you know, immediately, as soon as the, the, the keeper is like, oh, yeah, well, they're this. And it's like, well, you're the bad guy. Okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> just, and I, I just... I kind of appreciated that it was uh, you're you're you are one hundred percent right. This is a filler episode that has nothing to do with the box set, and uh, Susan was wasted. Becklin was wasted. The whole thing is an exercise, and the fact that this guy does not get any bigger punishment, well, of course not, because there's a time war on, and yeah. we need all hands on deck. It's right. like, eh, I, okay, whatever. But it was just kind of there, and I was okay with it. All right, let's wrap up with the shortage intervention. When Susan's TARDIS is intercepted, she is given a highly classified mission. Earth, 1963, is a nexus point in the Time War, but the timelines must be negotiated carefully. Mods and rockers are not the only dangers on the streets of Shoreditch, <laughs> and Susan's past, the Daleks are waiting. But so is the Doctor. Bob, Bob, Bob! Yeah, <laughs> this is the best one in the whole set, if you ask me. Very much so. Um... I think remarkably what I like about this is the fact that Susan's there in a pretense that she thinks she's needing to intercept this uh, device before the Daleks get it. And the Daleks have actually been the ones that lured her there in order to draw uh, them to it so they know where it's at. 
And so I like the fact that it connects to the fact to the first doctor having already just dropped it off and the seventh doctor still needing it to do what he does with it to launch uh, into the sun of And this is kind of sandwiched in between with, well, what do you do if the Daleks actually do come across this before the seventh doctor gets a chance to use it? So I really liked that. I liked the um, fact that, well, I guess when she goes, when she ends up going to this pawn shop, I sort of thought, well, I don't remember him leaving it a pawn shop. Wasn't it in a like tomb in a uh, cemetery or something? And mm-hmm. so when it's revealed that that isn't really where he dropped it off, um, that it was a ruse, uh, then that actually worked for me better. Uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the things that did bother me was the cause and effect issue of the only reason that the eighth doctor is there is because Susan contacts him because the Daleks are going to get the hand of Omega and she can't make that message until the doctor ends up saving her or getting them out of that situation. And so that I had a little bit of a problem with because I kind of felt like that was lazy writing or cheating a little bit, but that wasn't enough to get in the way of, of this being a really good fun story. Bill, remember a trash can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I can never be mad at that. I it's uh, anytime that comes up in any story, it's Bill and Ted physics and I let it go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I, necessarily I, love the mods versus, you know, greasers or whatever it was aspect of it. It felt a little unnecessary, but I think they were just trying to really send home the time period that it's supposed to be set in. So I, exactly. I was able to kind of let it go, but it felt like it was a little, a little too heavy handed, a little too much when they could have just done a, just talking about the fact that it's shortage and they're going after the hand of Omega right after he dropped it off. I didn't need anything else. I was well, good to go with what time frame. We're I, in. I think also they were kind of cleverly kind, uh, trying to uh, allude to the two factions that are in Remembrance of the Daleks against each other. And so I think that that was kind of a nod to that, having the two different, you know, the two different sides of this. I guess I don't remember those two factions. I'll have to go back and rewatch that one. No, they had the two. No, not not. They weren't mods rockers. That was the two factions of Daleks that were. Oh, yeah, oh standing I, okay, I, see I think saying. it was All just right. a. They were using sort of a, a clever parallel in that way. I don't think it was like a super thought out thing, but it kind of felt like they were saying, "Hey, remember when we had you know two factions here? Well, <laughs> we're doing it here too. Yeah, right, but in a different way. But in a different way. The, the mods right. and the rockers not not only establishing that sense of time and place. I think very much mentally painted this picture that this would have felt like a seventh doctor TV episode. Yeah. Yeah. That that seems like something they would have done. They would have really leaned into that. It gave it kind of a Delta and the Bannerman feel. Yes. That's exactly where I went with it. Um, Even the motorcycle race. Mm -hmm. It was like, man, it's when, when does Sylvester McCoy show up? (laughs) Is it (laughs) just, um, so there was a lot of that. The only problem I had with this is the idea that um, the doctor's claims that uh, he gave up the chameleon circuit in order to disguise the oh. end of Omega's container as a, uh, a, a crypt or a coffin. Right. Which is why the TARDIS becomes stuck as a police box, which would seem to contradict Hartnell <laughs> going, oh, it hasn't changed. Oh, my, 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 my. Why, why isn't, you know, and being worried about it. Well, if you took that out or maybe he took a component out and didn't think it was that big a deal i don't know (laughs) he still hadn't learned how it worked at this point so i guess i can let it go but i can almost excuse it the 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 drop line in this as the doctor you know claiming you know to know his tardis better all along than he ever has that's true because it's it's just making stuff up no (laughs) <laughs> just making stuff up to make himself look better. Right, right. It's also the Eighth Doctor who says it, so maybe he realizes now what it was. Oh, that's possible. You know, it's, oh, this is a cool thing. I'll put it on that, and that'll change that. Why yeah. hasn't it changed? <sighs> and all these years later, he goes, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Oh, he obviously <laughs> gets, he he fixes it later on though. So either he or he kind of fixes it later on. So either he gets a brand new one or it's not really gone. He probably built a new component for it. I like. <laughs> I kind of like the idea of he just removes a piece of it. And it, it, it does the thing, and he goes, oh, okay, they'll do that, and not realizing that that's the, 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 the very needed component that makes the whole system work. So he's got all the innards. He's got all the tubing and everything. He just doesn't have that piece anymore <sighs> and didn't realize how important it was. I kind of like that idea. That, that that seems like something the first Doctor very easily would have done mm -hmm. and dismissed because he probably skipped the class on, on chameleon circuits. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. The more I talk about it, the more I'm okay with the line. So. Yeah. <laughs> the more you can headcanon it. Yeah, the more I talk about it. I also loved the uh, the, the idea. It would just it, Again, it put, put, push that nostalgia button. We're going to summon a special weapons Dalek to destroy the TARDIS. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's right, because that's how badass they are. <laughs> we, we need one. Right. Go get it. <laughs> We're going to blow up a whole TARDIS with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here grinning. Yeah, baby. Go get it. <laughs> I kind of want to see it happen. <laughs> Overall impressions, the box set, it's really good. It's really nice to find them placing Susan. Uh, they could have easily done what they were you know, setting up the doctor to do in the uh, All Hands on Deck short trips. And just allowed Susan to avoid the time war altogether. But doing this and actually actively, aggressively putting her in it and giving her things to do in it, I think was a bold move by uh, by Big Finish. And I, I'm kind of glad that they went there and we are getting another piece of that puzzle of where uh, our beloved time wars, lords or even our you know non-beloved ones were at the time. Uh, that all this was happening. So I think this gives a, another piece of that, that grand puzzle. Yeah. I think the, the box set hits all the nostalgia buttons it needs to hit while advancing Susan as a character and giving us a different Susan than you expect to have, mm -hmm. which I like having the older, more wise Susan going through all these adventures. And I like the fact that, the adventures themselves are standalone. They don't necessarily tie into each other. They right. may flow into each other, but they don't tie into each other. And I like that aspect of it a lot too. Yeah. Agreed. Now, one question. Let me let me play a what if game with you. Do we think there would have been any value, at least certainly in the potential for at least squeezing one more box set out of this, had Susan taken the doctor up on his offer? when he said in the in the short trip, let me fly you away from here, come traveling with me again. Well, he even offers at the end of this last one yeah. to keep going with her and him instead of going back to the time war. And and, and what, if, what if she had said yes, and they went off and we got a box set of Eighth Doctor and Susan Adventures where they, they got into trouble and, and, and everything was, was grand and glorious and the Doctor and Susan in the TARDIS and look at us go... And yet everywhere they went was tinged with fallout or looming time war issues. And it began to gnaw on her conscience. And at the end of that box set, she said, no, grandfather, I can't do this. I have to go. And I, I can't, I can't be like you. I can't run. I have to respond. I have to go to Gallifrey. I have to do this. And then we get the ending of that. Would that maybe have, did they miss a trick by not so, doing that? Sounds or? like you've got the, uh, fixings of a spectric script to uh, send a big finish <laughs> i think you could set it up Ooh. where they encounter each other again at the beginning of the box set and she does take him up on the offer and then everything happens as you said yeah okay i'll get to work on that <laughs> I'll, i'd be also interested in, in a second box set just in general because her going off to meet rassilon and whatever's going to happen next i'd be right. fascinated to find out <laughs> what's going to happen i i sort of feel like they they intended to have a uh another box set come after this one and, and oh, glad, i don't think we're done with susan yeah anymore. i'm glad they are because i i'm, I'm really quite enjoying revisiting <laughs> susan and and because realistically, I mean, there, there's, there's books and stuff out there, but we really haven't gotten a lot with Carol Ann Ford. And so it's kind of nice to be able to get some of this now, uh, especially since everybody's aging and, and 
you know, not going to be with us a, a lot longer. So, yeah, I think I will. I think I'll write it. I think I'll just do an eighth Dr. Susan adventure and it'll be the heartwarming fun adventure that I wanted. Maybe, maybe they'll, <laughs> well, you know, you wouldn't even have to make the whole box set be then. You could just do one of the stories of the next box side set. Trip. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't side even, trip. I don't think it'd have to be the side trip. It could be one of the stories in the next box set. Well, they probably already have it planned out, but. You seem to plan these things out years in advance. Hello, fellow time travelers, and welcome to the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the only podcast to discuss, in story order, all the Doctor Who novelizations. My name is Tony Whit, and every two weeks or so, I'm joined by a two- to three-person discussion panel, including our so-called expert who's been a Who fan since 1979. That would be me. We also get the views of intermediate, casual, and novice fans who either have never seen the show or who have never read these books until these podcasts, including Dalton Hughes and Alison Fitzsafried. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you find good podcasts, or even ones like ours. You're listening to Traveling the Vortex, a Direction Point podcast. <laughs> Sean, what do we got coming up on the schedule? Well, do you like Paul McGann? We sure do, <laughs> and you're going to get a lot of him coming up. <laughs> uh, because we have not one, not two, not three, but four Eighth Doctor box sets. Time War 1, 2, 3, and 4 coming up uh, in the, uh, the, the next uh, several installments as we continue to work our way through Act 2 of the Time War. So lots of Eighth Doctor adventures to come. Uh, followed by uh, another short trip, A Heart on Both Sides, also from uh, Season 7. This one is uh, actually from the same uh, same set. I believe it's the story right before All Hands on Deck. It's 7-9, uh, yes. if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. And then uh, a little more River Song with some classic Doctor's New Monsters, uh, specifically the one in particular we will be eyeballing is Day of the Vashta, Day of the Vashta Narada. Because uh, we've reviewed everything else in that particular grouping, um, that uh, would be part of that uh, story well, arc. We we'll, we'll... Have, have we? Mm -hmm. I've listened to them, but I don't think we, you guys have listened to Volume Two. We haven't done Volume Two yet. Well, we not volume, volume Two, one. but everything else in the grouping as far as the Time Wars is concerned. Yeah. So, oh, what, yes, yeah. Yes. For what I'm trying to say, that yeah, particular ahead. story from one from the Diary of River Song one is in that one and then the classic monsters yes but you're right day of the vesta narada is the one out of the second new monsters classic doctors new monsters that we haven't uh done that whole box set so yes. correct yeah. i misspoke there are yeah. five river song stories that make up the the, the next well, segment of time war stories there's rulers of the universe from river like... songs not in classic doctors new monsters volume two. Oh, oh. okay I was getting confused yeah, there too, so I thought she just was the one Diary of River song. Okay, well, which then which I we have reviewed. So. <laughs> Once again, I have no memory of this. So. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some more who coming, uh, and uh, uh, that will actually finish off Act Two, uh, and then at some point in time in there, uh, we will also be taking a look at the. Uh, pencil tip publishing Doctor Who anthology, uh, the Temporal Logbook Three, uh, which yours truly was uh, fortunate enough to have a story published in. So we'll get more details on that as uh, as they arrive to us. But I can tell you the publication date nears. So we'll get uh, hopefully some advanced uh, copies that we can do something special with on the podcast. So continue to listen. Yay. Excited for that stuff. All right, be sure to check out our website, travelingthevortex.com, for updates on the podcast. And if you get any value out of this podcast, why not consider putting some value back into it? You can do that by clicking on our Patreon link and consider supporting us. And thank you to those who are already supporting us. And we've got lots of fun things coming, so uh, keep, keep, uh, keep that in mind. Also, please consider giving us a five-star review wherever you subscribe to the podcast. And make sure you join in on the conversation in our listeners forum on Facebook. Anything else we need to touch on before we finish this one? If not, until next time, I'm Glenn. I'm Sean. No, I'm Keith. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Be seeing you. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know why I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't usually do that. Because You're entitled? My, because my voice. Well, because my voice is next. You have been listening to Traveling the Vortex. Doctor Who and all of its associated programs are owned and trademarked by the BBC. No infringement is intended or implied. Direction point! Direction point! A Doctor Who Podcast Network.